Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. Today we are on location in Lewisburg, North Carolina. We're visiting East Coast Gear Supply and what we're going to do here is we're going to rebuild a couple of my differentials from my 98 4Runner. We're going to rebuild the 8 inch rear differential that has an e-locker and we're going to rebuild the 7.5 inch clamshell differential on my 4Runner. For this video, we're going to show you how to rebuild the 8 inch rear third member with the e-locker. We are lucky enough to have Chase Perry, the CEO of the company, do the work and describe all the intricacies of doing this job right. So let's get into the facility and meet Chase Perry and get this job started. Before we get in there and get started, I wanted to say a couple things. This is a true gift from Chase Perry because you're not gonna find a better instructor on this subject. The guy built his business from the ground up to where it is today, which is a very, very successful business that specializes in differentials and axles. You're not gonna get the equivalent of getting a GED or the certificate in this type of work. You're gonna get the PhD version of this job because the guy just has so much knowledge to share and that's why the video is so long because he imparts so much more information than you'd get in any other video. Most videos are gonna be very concise and they're not gonna go into the detail that Chase does of all the intricacies of this job. This video is obviously very long and if you have the patience to watch it, you're gonna learn a lot. If you lack patience, this is probably not the job for you because building differentials, doing re-gears, installing lockers and that sort of thing, it's a test of patience and you have to be patient and you have to be very detailed in order to do it right. If you lack patience, you're probably not gonna be successful and it's gonna have a very bad result. Once you get your rear differential reinstalled and your rig is all ready to go, don't just go out there and do a long 5,000 mile trip with it because there is a suggested break-in period for the gears that East Coast Gear Supply has published. If you got your differential worked on by them, they will send the instructions in the box with your differential. They also have it listed amongst their tech articles on their website. So in case you did the work yourself or maybe the instructions didn't end up inside the box, you can look it up straight on their website. So basically for the first 500 miles, you're supposed to drive it a certain way and you should follow those instructions to make sure your gears break in properly and you're not gonna get any excessive wear or damage your gears, which would leave you very unhappy. So do yourself a favor and pay very close attention to those instructions to make sure that your rear differential is gonna give you thousands and thousands and thousands of trouble-free miles. I'll put a link to these instructions in the video description. I also wanted to tell you that this video is not gonna cover the removal and reinstallation of the rear differential. We do have a video in existence for that job. If you know our channel, we filmed a rear differential swap for our buddy Jordan a few years ago. So if you click on the link above, you can watch that video. With all that said, now let's get into the facility and get this job started. So we're here with Chase and Chase is gonna be showing us how you would tear apart a rear third member on your Toyota and do all the necessary things to put in new gears and new bearings and get everything correct. So this is a uh, e-locker diff. This is what Tim's got in his four on right? That's what you got, four on yeah. yeah. So we'll just kind of go through the process. First thing I want to show you, particularly when you get a diff from us, is I already pulled this e-locker motor off. The e-locker motor just sits here on the back and the housing studs actually hold it in here and here, and then this bolt will bolt it. So if you drop the third member out, you just remove this bolt, and then you just pry it up. 
Now, if you look down in here is the gear. The dip is currently locked in right now, which if you read the factory service manual, it tells you to lock it before you remove it. And most people don't. So I just unlocked it. And you can see these gears, that's what the motor engages to. So this is unlocked. This would be towards the driver tire. If you pulled your diff and the motor was in the unlocked position, before you put the motor back on, you have to unlock it. So lock, unlock. And you can just take a screwdriver, or you can even do it with your finger. There's detents in there, so sometimes it's hard to do it with your hands. But a little screwdriver, whenever you're putting the motor back on, this needs to be in the position that you remove the motor. So if you hold it unlocked, make sure that this gear is all the way to your driver side tire. But like you said, you're supposed to pull this locked, right? That's what the factory service manual says. You can always disconnect the motor in the vehicle, pop it off, and then lock it in. Because unless you've done a modification, you've got to like put the truck in four wheel low to get the motor to lock and all that. If you don't want to waste your time doing that, just pull the motor off and then you can manually slide it to the lock position. The reason why they tell you that is I'll show you when we flip it over. So this is the other side. This is what's happening. This is unlocked and when the motor pushes it in then it locks to the spider gear and now the spider gears are locked together so when it's out in the unlocked position the reason why the factory service manual tells you to pull it locked is so that this doesn't get hung up when you're coming out it really doesn't matter you can pull them out fine unlocked it's just making sure it's in the right orientation when you put the motor back on because when you put it in you hook up the motor if it's wrong all your lights will be flashing and then you'll call my sales guys and ask them why your diff doesn't work and that's why. Gotcha. Yeah, so when I pulled my rear third member, I did read the factory service manual. So I did actually put it in four low and locked it because I didn't want to take off the actuator. So that's what I did. Yeah, I rolled back and forth on my driveway, got it to lock, and then I lifted it up and pulled it. So when you get the diff back, you want it engaged all the way towards the center. Gotcha. All right, so now we'll just start taking it apart. All right, so here's your side adjuster keepers. They're 12 mils. So typically, which Tim mentioned this, you'd want to mark your bearing cap. I usually keep a stamp around. On an e-locker dip, you don't actually have to because you can't get them confused. There's only threads on one side and the carrier caps are different sizes, so you can't put it together wrong. But if this was a regular Toyota dip, where the caps were matching, you're gonna to wanna to make some match marks with a stamp. You can just do two dots, two dots, whatever, just so you absolutely know that the carrier bearing caps are going on the same way that they came off. The reason why that's important is because when they're machining this thing, this is a raw casting and they're putting a boring bar through here and everything's in that line. So if you go opposite directions and side to side, then it, it's not gonna to wanna to line up properly. And you might get away with it, but you could also get into cross-threading adjusters, et cetera, et cetera. We did wash this, which is helpful because it takes care of some of the oil. So here's some pliers. These are ARB ones. I've had these for a while. But this will just help you break the adjuster loose. Now it's loose. So really there's nothing else holding this in here. So you're just gonna... On this differential, you can't get anything mixed up because everything's different sizes. But here's your locking collar. If you look down in here, that's what it's engaging to. So this is out, unlocked, and then as it slides in, it's locking to this side gear and splining here. So the side gear is then locked to the case, and that's why it's spinning all the time. As opposed to, as you can see, I can turn that without the ring gear moving. That's your spider gears rolling around each other. Carriers out. These are keeper locks to keep your ring gear bolts from backing out. It's what Toyota uses. So you've got to take a chisel 
and a hammer, and you're just going to knock these down and out of the way. Sometimes they break. A lot of people don't put these back. We usually do. It's just a little bit of extra insurance. We obviously use red Loctite and torque the bolts. This is just extra protection. So we got all our keeper locks out of the way, so now we can back the ring gear bolts out. This diff had a healthy amount of Loctite. All right, so your ring gear bolts are out. The gear is piloted right here, and it's an interference press fit. So the gear is stuck on there. If you don't want to damage the gear, like to use a punch that's smaller than the thread, and then just work your way around. All right, so now we got to pull the carrier bearings. A lot of times these bigger ones can get loose, so they come off fairly easily, usually. So this bearing is a little tricky. Two jaw puller works the best. And there's a little cutout between these two bolts so that you can get your fingers from the puller, which here's the puller. So a little insert drops down in here to give you something to press against. So you wanna make sure that you're underneath the actual race of the bearing and not on the cage. That came off pretty easily. So what we do to protect that going forward is we'll actually, we'll knurl this surface and then we'll use a sleeve retaining compound. So we'll pull the other one and then we'll take it over to the fab shop and get them to fix it up. So because that bearing came off so easily, that means there's not enough interference between the two parts so you don't want it that loose. Correct, yeah. You wanna make sure that that bearing doesn't spin. It was still a very, very light press fit. This one will probably come off a little harder. You can basically tell how hard the impact has to work. See, it's having to work a lot harder. We don't necessarily have to knurl this side. We'll still use a sleeve retaining compound, but definitely want to knurl that large side. Yeah, it was obvious based off of how hard the impact gun was working, that bearing fit much tighter onto the carrier. So we'll clean up a little bit our mess and take this to the machine shop and have them knurl it for us. So Kevin's chucking the carrier up in the lathe and we'll do a process called knurling where you basically indent the surface and that will make the parent material get less in some spots, but it'll grow in other spots. So if you can't make something grow, knurling something is a good way to get your press fit back. Knurling is just a little cross hatch. It will kind of make the material grow a little bit. It'll also provide a good scoring surface for any like uh, glue or seal packing compound or any kind of sealant that we're going to put underneath the race. It'll give it good surface to adhere to. Who makes this stand? SST, you can buy them on eBay. I think they're like a hundred bucks or something. SST, huh? There's a bunch of different ones on eBay. Uh, I'm sure Amazon or whatever. We've modified. They're like cheap enough that it's better to start with something than having laser cut half inch plate and whatever else. So we've got all sorts of different ones. This is kind of the universal one that works pretty good and works for just about everything. All right, so we're going to remove the pinion. Carrier's out. We're going to remove the pinion. Pinion nut's staked. You can leave it staked. Uh, this is a 30 millimeter. It's a good idea to just put your pinion nut back on. That way, when you're beating the pinion out, if you get off, you don't damage the threads, particularly if you're trying to save the ring and pinion. So this is the air hammer. If you don't have one, you can use a drift and there's a little indention in the pinion and then you can just beat it out with a hammer or you could take it over to the press. You could press it out. The yoke actually isn't that tight. It's the bearing surface and somewhat the yoke and some are tighter than others. It depends on how wore out the diff is, etc. You could take this pinion nut 
and the pinion would just drop out. That means that the splines and the yoke or the ring and pinion are worn and the bearing surfaces are worn. It's an interference to press fit, which as we go back to assembly, you'll see we have to beat the yoke back on and seat all this stuff. And sometimes people are like, oh, this bearing doesn't go on or whatever. Well, it does, it's a press fit. So you do have to beat it on. In a Toyota, you could take it over to the press. You could press this stuff on in a vehicle or whatever. Like you don't have the luxury to use presses and all that stuff. So uh, we usually just use the air hammer, air hammer it out, and then we'll knock it back in. So it's loose. I left the nut on there, keep it from dropping out. Obviously I had my hand underneath it, so I would have caught it. But like if your air hammer or drift gets off, you can damage the pinion thread and then that's no fun. So yoke's off, pinion's out, there's your crush lead. This is the crush yep, lead that's right the crush there. Lead. We'll talk about that solid spacer crush lead when we go back to assembly. Here's one of those things that I like to tell people about. Removing a pinion seal, pretty easy, seal puller, whatever. But you want to make sure that you don't stick a seal puller in something like this where it drags this casting because basically you can drag it and you'll create a groove on the OD and then the oil will try to leak past it. So if I'm removing a pinion seal, I always beat it down in on one side and then it wants to pop out to the other side and there's no chance of me damaging that surface. I like that technique, that's so, slick. And it comes out easy. So if you put a seal puller in there, it's actually a lot harder to pry it out and that's what I'm talking about. And so if you get underneath this thing and you drag your tooling across this machine surface, you can create a groove there for oil to leak past. So you just want to protect this machine surface so your seal seals nicely. This is just a spacer between the outer bearing and the pinion yoke. Some people call it a deflector. Some people call it a baffle, but really it's just a spacer. Toyota has them. You don't necessarily need to run it if you didn't have one or whatever. Some diffs have them, some don't. I've heard they call that an oil slinger. It's not actually a slinger because it's not slinging oil. Oil's traveling up through this channel and it's so small that it's really not doing a whole lot. It will hold oil here, which would be more considered a baffle because you see the rollers here. When this covers it up, oil's coming back here and it'll pour into here and then it'll keep it from swinging out. So it's more like a baffle. All right, so here's your outer bearing. So it's out. And now we have to knock the races out of the housing. And you're gonna use a drift. I like to take the outer out first. And that way you've got a little bit more room to get to the inner. Flip it over. You can just see the race there. So you gotta catch that lip. Tim just mentioned using a brass drift or a steel drift. If we use brass drifts, we'd have to use a new one every day. If you were beating a race back in and you want to protect the race, then using a brass drift is a really good idea. We don't drive our races in with a drift. We do it with a puck that's on size and it does it a little more squarely. So steel drift to get them out kind of protects your tooling and you're not really worried about damaging the race unless you're planning on putting it back, which we certainly are not. Just work your way around it, alternate it, knock it out a little at a time. We'll flip it over and now we'll get the inner race. When you're driving races out, and I was careful and I don't anticipate there's any issues. This is our race seat right here. When you're knocking races out with a drift like that, you wanna make sure you didn't damage this surface here, which would push this race seat up. If you did, you wanna go in there and file it down and make sure this is dead flat because that's gonna mess with your bearing alignment. This is the outer, but on the inner, it'll mess with your pinion depth. This one feels good, I didn't damage it. This is just brake clean and a rechargeable canister. Make sure you don't have any dirt or debris because you don't want that dirt and debris to get underneath your race seats. We can go ahead and knock the outer in since it's facing this direction. 
you're gonna knock this in and you don't have the correct driver, you could use a brass drift and work your way around slowly to get it to seat. So we've got it perfectly machined in the OD and the ID to kind of pilot it and keep everything centered. So that's um, a custom driver? Yeah. So you just want to make sure when you're driving this in that you're not actually damaging where the bearing's riding. You want all the force going out on the outer lip, correct? Correct, yep, because these are your roller surfaces here. So we want these to be nice and clean and smooth. And then all these surfaces in here, this is your pinion seal surface. Make sure we don't want to damage any of that. And then this is your press surface here for your race. We don't want to monkey any of that. So I suppose that the generic kits that you can get, you could find a puck that would fit the race pretty well? Yeah, similar, yeah, okay. definitely. You heard the tone change? That's a solid hit, it's seated. Yeah, that's what I always tell people when they're driving in seals or races that you could tell from the effort and you could tell from the change of the tone, right? Yep. All right. We're gonna clean this surface out again, check it, make sure there's no debris. Same deal. All right, so I cleaned the gasket surface. I like to use a wire brush because it's not gonna take parent material. It takes a little bit longer to do it that way. Some people use like an abrasive disc on a die grinder, which you can do and it's fine. My personal preference is just a wire wheel. It's the way I've always liked to do it because I don't wanna create uneven spots. If you do use a Scotch-Brite pad like this, you're likely not gonna create any uneven surfaces. And sometimes you do need to go back and make sure that it is flat, you can feel it. There is a little high spot right here, which I would take that out with a um, little scotch bright pad. And that's probably from rocks or whatever, somebody dragging the diff. Do you suggest when people reseal their third member to the axle housing to use a paper gasket or just use the, the regular FIPG? FIPG works better, I believe. So gaskets are great when it's new, You've got a brand new housing, brand new machine surface, brand new casting, brand new machine surface, paper gasket, have a nice day. But as you can see, you know, this diff is older, so there's all sorts of little imperfections over the years of rust and these high spots. So when you use an RTV, it'll fill in those gaps. So we don't use paper gaskets unless we're building something that's brand new, and then we do use paper gaskets. They don't make a lube locker, which is the rubber steel reinforced gaskets for these e-lockers. They do for some of the other Toyota diffs, and those are fine because it will smush that rubber and it'll kind of fill in some of these imperfections, but I don't care for paper gaskets on used stuff. Toyota differentials typically shim underneath the bearing. So there's a shim underneath here. Whenever you're building the diff, modern technology, your best bet is to remove the old bearing, get the factory shim off, and then start with that shim on your first assembly to run a pattern, and then make shim adjustments from there. Unless you build hundreds of diffs a week and you know exactly what shim you wanna put in to start with based upon the ratio, the manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. So I will show you how we pull this bearing off. Because they shim under the bearing, you can get a bearing splitter underneath here and then put it in a press and press it out. But this tool is pretty handy. So the way this tool works is you leave the race on the bearing and this adjuster sleeve screws onto the race and tightens it against it. So you can hook underneath the cage and it's gonna clamp it together and pull the bearing off. Depending on the shim thickness, a lot of times you can actually get this little clamshell all the way underneath the inner race of the bearing. But on this one, it actually won't. So we do have to find a clamshell. That just barely fits it. We'll see what happens. The bottom nut is tight against the race. Top nut is tight against this clamshell. And then you match up your sides. Put on the collar, that should lock it in. 
so your bearings most of the way off. This puller is actually a little short. Sometimes I'll put a spacer in there. The tool is not quite tall enough to pull that all the way off of its press surface. So if you put like a little spacer in between there, then it would give you the height to remove it the rest of the way. But that's the process to get the bearing off. Or like I said, use a bearing splitter to come under it, put it in the press and press it out. So how are you gonna get it off the rest of the way? I could put a spacer in there, put like a socket on there or something. It was right there. Oh, shoot. <laughs> this bearing puller is essential to anyone that wants to rebuild differentials for a living. I would say in my career, of all the tools ever, this is the most handy tool ever made. Whoever designed and invented this thing was a genius because as you can see, the bearing is fine, could be reused, and it's pretty quick, really. And I don't know if you guys caught it. I finished it in the press, but you can do something similar. It's basically just the design where you're compressing the race against the cage so you can pull it up. You also notice as I was doing it, I was knocking it against the table. That will, a lot of times, if you got one that's pretty tight, it'll equalize and just help it to come off a little bit easier. Yeah, these are Yukons and we've had probably 50 of them over the years. Everybody's got one and we use them a hundred times a day. So. If you're just doing one differential for one time in your life, we actually rent this tool. We'll rent you a dial indicator, this tool, and a inch pound torque wrench, which we'll get into later. So those are three tools that basically makes your life way easier. Well, the measuring you have to have if you want to do it right. You could sometimes use this on the carrier bearings, but because this is an e-locker, that's why we had to use that two jaw puller. If you just went and bought the parts off our website and wanted to build the diff yourself, I think these are like 300 bucks. If you don't want to spend 300 bucks because you're only going to use it once, you can actually rent it from us and you have the tools to do it without investing. And the other thing we do a lot of times, really why we rent the tool is because I sell that tool to the guy that rents it. He rents it, he uses it, and he's like, oh my gosh, you were right, this tool's awesome. I just want to keep it and then we'll just sell it to you. So with this style of puller compared to like using a bearing splitter and then just put it in like a regular Harbor Freight press or whatever people have, yeah. is there less room for error doing it this way than with a bearing splitter? Like, is there other advantages other than like, it's a little quicker to set up than using a standard bearing splitter? So with a bearing splitter, which we very rarely use, a lot of times you're going to damage the bearing because you can't get the profile underneath the bearing and without damage in the cage. So when you pull it, it'll kind of compress the cage and it'll damage the bearing. So because this shims, you know, once I press this bearing on here, if this isn't the right shim, I've got to do this all over again and over and over and over again. So there's set up bearings where you hone out the inside of the bearing so it just slides on and off so you can change shims. We don't like to use those because they can be inaccurate to what you're building, right? So if that bearing's a little bit off, put it in and out of a million diffs, you put a final bearing on it and the pattern changes, you're going back and guys are quick at pulling bearings. So we usually just press the bearings on. If it's a diff that we're not familiar with, we have no idea where we're going, maybe we don't have a starting shim, then yeah, we throw a setup bearing on there to let's get in the general ballpark. But these Toyota diffs are pretty consistent as are the ring and pinions and stuff. And so if you know the stock shim going back, you're gonna be pretty close. You're just gonna be making some fine adjustments. And I don't wanna make a fine adjustment on a setup bearing to put it together to be like, oh, it's still not what I want. So we have to pull the bearing off. For us, it saves time to press bearings and just pull them off. The Yukon tool is obviously beneficial for you to be able to pull the bearings off cleanly without damaging the new bearing as opposed to the bearing splitter you have a chance of messing up your bearing and then you've wasted some money yeah correct okay and again if you're doing a new dip and you're pressing bearings chances are you're gonna have to change the shim so you, unless you want to buy five bearings you need a way to be able to pull the bearing on and off and just disassembly etc so you can get to the stock shim the stock shim's not damaged so i can get a good measurement on that if we used a bearing splitter and you put the bearing splitter underneath there and you compress this shim and damaged it then you don't have your stock shim etc etc now we're going to start pre-assembly start pressing bearings we're we'll talking about right here here's your mating surface back of the ring gear the case you want to check this for any high spots and check the ring gear for high spots it can have them around where they've machined the ring gear bolts and stuff if you read the manuals it'll talk about stoning and filing and stuff i don't feel anything out of the ordinary 
But I do like to take a scotch brite pad and hit both surfaces. So just a light amount to make sure that there's no crazy debris or anything sticking up that might cause it not to sit flat. So this is the pilot for the ring gear here, and this is going to be a press fit. So as you can see, she barely drops on there until it gets to the pilot, and then it's not going to drop the rest of the way. You'll see people pressing these on, beating them on. We heat the ring gear on a hot plate, and so while we're pressing carrier bearings and our pinion bearing, we'll let this heat up. We'll go ahead and put the pinion in the differential while this thing gets hot and then it'll drop right on and it's easy to install. Here's our hot plate, Walmart, whatever. You can use a small toaster oven. You can use your home oven. 350 degrees is what we put it at. Let it sit five, 10 minutes until it's nice and toasty to the touch. And that'll open it up enough that it'll drop on. So we'll let that heat up while we press and bearing. So we've got our carrier bearing small and our large side. We had previously had the machine shop knurl this for us. So if you look at this surface now, it's nice and rough, has some larger parent material for that to grab onto. We left this one alone because it was nice and tight. And you can see the difference between the two surfaces. We will use sleeve retainer compound on both. So we'll take it over to the Arbor Press. We'll press these on. One thing to note, and this is a big error of lots of different people. When you're pressing a bearing on, this is the inner race. And this is where all the pressure has to go. All the force needs to be applied there. If you apply force to the cage, it'll break out the bearing rollers and you'll damage the bearing. So you gotta have something, and this one's a little tricky because it's this big one, but you want something that fits over this and just hits the inner cage. So there's no chance of me damaging that bearing cage when I'm pressing this on. This other side is a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about this journal sticking up through. You can just use any puck, something to go on there, only press on this surface. Same with the pinion. A lot of guys will use a piece of tube that's too big and it's gonna hit the cage of this bearing when you're pressing it on. But you've gotta be only hitting this inner portion. And so we've got this little piece of tube, nothing fancy, that goes over at pilots and we'll actually press it upside down. So we'll take our bearings, our pinion, our carrier all over to the press. Could you tell me, Chase, is this a custom thing that you've made right here that will handle that larger bearing? Uh, correct. All right, so we're pressing the bearings now. We'll do this big one. This is our sleeve retainer that I spoke about. For sleeve retainer to work properly, you're gonna wanna brake clean this, get it nice and clean. I have done so. So again, Tim was asking me about this thing. He's like, what the heck, where do you get that? Well, you don't get it, you make it. And so you can see it's exactly the right size and something that we've put together over the years. It helps when you have a full scale machine shop and fabrication department and you tell them all your whims and they make it for you. You could take your old bearing and you could use this inner, hone it out a little bit and then accomplish the same thing, which honestly I think is what this was at some point. So we've cleaned these surfaces real good and we're going to apply a liberal amount of sleeve retainer. The sleeve retainer is a little bit like Loctite. It's green, but specially formulated to take up like a thousandths gap, which we're well under that. We're gonna be a nice press fit now, particularly since we have knurled it. So I wanna reiterate this special pressing sleeve that East Coast Gear Supply has made for this application. It fits the inner race of the bearing perfectly. And then the inner diameter of the sleeve is also big enough to where it won't interfere with the carrier that the bearing is pressing onto. All right, you'll see the sleeve retainer oozed out. So you wanna go back, wipe it off, and we'll brake clean it some more, blow it out, make sure we don't have any sleeve retainer in the bearing. I press this large one first because the back side of this is flat and I don't have to worry about it. Had I pressed this one on first, when I went to put on the large carrier bearing, then this bearing would have been sitting against this and we would have been pressing against the cage again if we wouldn't have put a spacer in or something of that nature. Yeah, so you would have had to 
put a spacer that just met up with the inner race as a support. So yeah, like this spacer, which is what I'm gonna use, would have worked, but I would have had to set the carrier on it just like that so you don't damage it. So I'm gonna sleeve retain this one as well. Better safe than sorry, but this is a better press fit. Same, you can see the sleeve retainer working its way out. I didn't have to worry about it sliding over the journal on this side because the inner race sticks up past it. So any puck that's not pressing on the cage is fine. It's a good idea before you press to make sure this spins free. So that way you're not putting any pressure on it. Who makes this sleeve retainer stuff? Oh, Loctite or whoever makes Loctite 3M. That uh, is the technical term for it, sleeve retainer? Correct, yeah, retaining compound. Retaining compound, okay. Um, so actually this is an old bottle. We actually buy this stuff in liters and then we just refill it. We go through liters and liters of Loctite, sleeve retainer, all that stuff. And these are just original bottles that we just keep filling up. Gotcha. Brand new ring and pinion, brand new bearing. I did grease this surface a little bit. Some of that is also because they do like a phosphate coating and it can be like real dry and catchy. If you'll notice, I had previously emery cloth this a little bit to get it nice and smooth. But if you see here, it's got that black coating on it and that doesn't press great. It can get hung up, but the tolerances are good. We typically just grease it. I have measured a shim pack here and this is basically a known good starting depth for us. Toyotas are around 80. 80,000? Yeah, all the factory Toyota stuff's around 80,000. So somewhere in that general vicinity is where you want to start. I'm going to be a little bit closer. So as you can tell, a lot more force went into getting this pinion bearing on than those carrier bearings, which is pretty standard. You'll also notice that this press surface sticks out. So this little piece of tube has been bored slightly so that it doesn't get hung up and stuck on there. Before you put it together, you just want to make sure your tube can go without getting stuck. Our bearings are on. My ring gear is already pretty much hot. Doesn't take very long. I'm gonna prep these ring gear bolts. Like I talked about with that sleeve retainer and Loctite, your ring gear bolts have to be clean and free of oil or it's not gonna work nearly as well or at all. I'd already hit these one other time, but you wanna make sure they're nice and clean and dry. A couple of these show a little rust on them which honestly won't hurt anything. Did you knock off the old Loctite with like a wire wheel or something? Or? Uh, these are new bolts. All oh, those are new bolts, yeah. okay. But if somebody was reusing bolts and they'd obviously want to clean off all the Loctite with a wire wheel or whatever they got? Correct. So that's the strong stuff, the red Loctite, right? Yeah, this is high temp, oil resistant. This says Vibratite 137, but I don't believe that's what we have in this. I think we're using 3M in liter jugs and again, we just refill these. It's like when you go to a restaurant and the ketchup says Heinz. It's not Heinz. <laughs> Those are refills. And you're putting a generous amount on there. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Loctite. I don't like stuff to come apart. And then it can also rotate around a bit. All right, I'll grab my hot ring gear. So because I've got it hot, I can spin it, but otherwise you are not spinning this thing. So now you can just line it up with the hole. The whole thing about heating it up is just so you could slide the ring gear onto the carrier really easily and then also be able to turn it to where you can line up the bull holes. Correct, yeah. You can try to line it up, you can try to press it on, but this is the easiest, fastest method in my opinion. So I like to just spin it, get a couple tight so the ring gear is seated, and then flip it over so you can see what you're doing crisscross pattern and then I like to go in a circle so I like to go in a circle like that and use an impact for a couple reasons one you don't miss any two that initial crisscross should seat it to where it's not deflecting anymore 
and then when I torque, I just go in a circle too. I don't crisscross, which a lot of people would say, you have a lot better chance doing a crisscross pattern, missing one, I think, than you do in a circle. So torque spec ranges from 65 to 75, depending on what manual you read. I do 75. No chance of me missing one. Because you have the Loctite and the torque properly, you don't worry about those keepers. I left the keepers off because I wanted to show you a trick on how to run a pattern. You can't do it with the keepers on there. So that's why I left them off. We're gonna put the pinion in. So you wanna apply some lube here for a couple of different reasons. One, you don't want the bearing to dry start. Two, this will help the gear run through itself. Again, like I talked about with the coating on it, they can be kind of dry and sticky. So if you get some oil down in here, it'll make running the pattern a little bit easier, show up better, it'll rotate nice and smooth. So, you know, just facing like this, it's easy to just drop that pinion bearing in. You know, your yoke's obviously going like this. You'll notice I'm not putting a crush leave or anything in because we're still in the pattern stage. If you were doing final assembly, you're gonna be putting a crush leave on or doing a solid spacer, but if we're just running patterns and depth, then we don't need a crush leaf in it. We're just tightening up the bearing so there's a little load, and then we're going to run the pattern. So as you can see, it's a little tricky. I'm not really at a great angle. A little bit easier to do it this way. So you were just counting on the pinion flange enough to where you could get the pinion nut started, right? Correct. You want to make sure you got plenty of thread exposed so when you go to put the pinion nut on, you're not going to strip it because sometimes people will try to put the nut on too early and then you can end up damaging the thread. You want to make sure you got quite a bit of engagement of the threads before you start to drive this on with the impact gun, right? Correct. So I'm setting pinion preload there by pushing it together. Obviously, I've done this a few times. I would say that's probably like 12. So 12 inch pounds when rotating, it's about 10 if you look at it. So if you do this long enough, you can pretty much feel what preload is. Obviously on a final assembly, you want to check it, make sure it's within spec. Particularly on these differentials, the outer pinion bearings have a tendency to go bad. And we do a lot of just general stock repairs because of outer pinion bearings. You definitely do not want to overload this pinion bearing. On a new build, I would not go over 15. If you read the manuals, the specs, it's higher than that, but absolutely would not put one of these TV6 or E-lockers above 15 for a daily driven vehicle that's going to get a lot of miles. So eight is okay. Eight to 12 is where I like to be on these. And so that's inch pounds, right? Correct. And that's rotating. This is a beam style. When I start, it takes about 20 inch pounds to start it. Just for a second there, right? But what does it take? to keep it constantly moving, which is around 10. You're not looking at the value when you first start, but when you finally get it rotating, you're looking at that value and you want somewhere between eight and 12. Yes, that's where I set mine. That is not what the manual says. What does the manual say? I think it can get into like the 25 range. Again, there's a lot of different manuals and there's kind of a lot of varying information. So Toyota might say 25? I think I have read 25 and that is way too much. Okay. All right, so pinions in. We got some preload on here, and now we're gonna drop the carrier in. I'm greasing these carrier bearings. And what's your preferred weight of your oil? 85, 140, non-synthetic, Lucas. And that's what you recommend everybody run, correct? Every single dip. Why do you recommend that weight when the OEM spec is like 75, 90? I think OEM runs a... 80 w I thought it runs a 75, 140 synthetic. Again, which manual do you read? There's been so many recommendations over the years, but like if you look at the cling factor, if you do that with synthetic, look at it hanging off my glove. 
So that's the same thing, right? So when this ring and pinion comes around, that oil is clinging here. So when it comes through, it's got a nice cushioning factor. And that's why I like the thicker weight oil. And I don't care for synthetics all that much, although I think they do have a place from time to time. I got a write up on our website that talks about it. And again, it's just an opinion. You don't have to like my opinion, but just in my experience, there's a lot of bad synthetics out there that you pay more for, and you're way better off just running a dyno oil that you change more frequently. We've dropped the bearing adjusters in here. You can see me kind of working them back and forth, trying to make sure that they're not cross-threaded. Sometimes it can be a little tricky to know because you're only going into half. I'm sure there's a lot of different ways to do this too, but the way that I do it is like this. So I put it in, I believe it's right. I screw the bolt in just a couple turns and then it should just push down by hand. If it doesn't, chances are it's not right, which see, I've got a little air gap right yeah, there. Yeah, you got a gap there. So chances are this thing isn't exactly right. So now we'll try again. Sometimes they are a little tough. We can try the other side in the meantime. Okay, so that one pops right on, but there's no air gap here. And I didn't have to force this thing at all, right? You don't want to force these things. And this thing spins nice and free. So I feel good about this one. This one's right. So basically you get the bearing cap on over the adjuster and if it will seat all the way down to the carrier with no gap and you could still turn the bearing adjuster very easily, you know you have it threaded right and it's not cross threaded. Yeah. Uh, so I'll snug this one up. When I say snug it up, just barely. So that's hand tight. We don't have to worry about it moving or something jumping out while I'm screwing around with this one. You can also seat it like that and then screw it in from the outside if method A wasn't working. So that seemed to work. So again, no air gap, no air gap. This thing's spinning. I have not put any force whatsoever to make that go together. Because if you mess up these threads, then you're gonna be hate life, right? Yeah, because you gotta file them because it's not like anybody's got like a, well, maybe somebody does, but we don't, a tap or a chaser. So you gotta file them individually and that's no fun. Okay, so back to our adjustment pliers. We're just spinning it back and forth. We're gonna get backlash. This big one is a little bit more difficult to deal with because you've got the fork over here. So is there a proper order where you tighten one side more than the other first to get it set? What I do is I bring this side all the way over until it doesn't have any backlash or just barely, and then I'll drive this one into it. So that's got about two thou backlash. Right now it's got zero backlash. I've got this adjuster forced all the way over so the ring gear is pressed against the pinion. When I say press, very lightly. So I've got zero backlash, but now I can open up the backlash by preloading these bearings and just forcing everything together. So backlash opened up just a little bit. You're tightening them? Yes, correct. I'm now tightening this side and I'm forcing it back this way. Uh, so that's probably about right. And so when you're talking about backlash, you're talking about how much movement you could move the ring gear in relation to the pinion. Is that a good description or? Yes. So I've generally zeroed that. How are you setting up the dial indicator? Like right at the edge of the tooth? Uh, correct, yeah. And I like to put my dial indicator up here so I can still get to my adjuster. But so I'm a little rusty. It's about 10. So that's a little bit wider than what we would typically run and kind of the gear is like. Now remember, I ran this all the way against, had zero backlash, and then I just tightened this to preload it to open up that backlash. So that's a good starting point. Now remember, these bolts aren't tight. They're just barely seated because I wanted all this stuff to move freely. And now that I'm in a general vicinity of where I want this to go, now I'll tighten these up and I'll start adjusting these to where I really want to get it which will start with a pattern with about a six to eight thou backlash. So I am gonna to have to back this one up a little bit. We've got some special tools um, that make it a little bit easier to put more pressure on these and torque these. Now I'm gonna snug these up a little tighter. 
and make sure that that carrier is in fact fully seated. All right, so that's four. And now I can just tighten this up a little bit. Maybe five, what's the number we're looking for? Six to eight. Six-ish. So while you're tightening up that side, is there a point where you're getting too strong of a clamp on those carrier bearings? Not really. So overloading carrier bearings is pretty difficult. Again, depending what you read, what manual, they'll talk about torquing these to anywhere from 50 to 150. I think 150 is a little firm. I have seen people overload carrier bearings uh, because you can do it if you have the tooling, but torquing this out to about 75, I feel like is a good range. There's a feel to a diff for me. So this carrier shouldn't just bounce around. It's not moving, right? And actually we can prove it. It's not moving. So if it had no preload or it didn't have any preload on it, this thing's gonna be flopping around. You've actually got to really grab hold of this thing to check it. So right now we're at about six thou backlash there. It's a good idea to rotate it and check it somewhere else. So that's about five. I don't like to run anything under four. If you start getting into that five area, there's nothing wrong with four or five backlash, but I like to just be very careful and check a lot of different positions and make sure we've got backlash everywhere. And is that because the milling of the teeth isn't like exact? We've got this coating on here, all sorts of little things. Obviously this is used. So there's gonna be some run out. When people talk about run out, if you had a wide varying backlash, you set your dial indicator up right here on the back side of this ring gear and then turn it and then watch your dial. So it should be one tooth out run out of this assembly. And there's a lot of competing forces that are happening. You've got the line bore of the carrier. You've got the pilot on the carrier. You've got your mating surfaces. You've got the cut of the teeth, all these things that are impacting backlash. So there's gonna be some variance throughout this ring and pinion. If you checked every tooth in a perfect world on a new setup, then yes. But when you start getting into used stuff where it has tweaked and stuff, there's gotta be some allowment for some varying backlash. We oiled that pinion. I like to oil the ring gear as well. So in order to get a pattern to show up well, you've got to place a load on it to get the pattern to basically smooth out. You saw I sprayed it with like a little WD-40. You can pour oil on it. I like to lubricate the teeth before we paint a pattern and then we'll load it up. All right, so I oiled my teeth pretty good. My paint's a little thin. The stuff they send you in the kit is way too thick. So you definitely want to thin it out with some oil. You can paint a couple of different spots. You paint about four teeth in a couple of different spots? Yeah. And again, a lot of this is what level you want to do to. So I like to get three spots. And you're um, painting both sides of the teeth? Correct. So drive, so that means when you're in the drive, this is seeing the force and then coast is the opposite side. So when you're in coast, this sees the force. Drive, coast, drive, coast. Okay. So we're gonna rotate it into place where the pattern is. So I've got the yellow paint down there with the pinion, and then I'm gonna put my leg against this pinion to load it. This isn't good for your wardrobe. <laughs> you want to run it through quite a few times to make sure you get an accurate look. So you're actually putting your thigh against yep. there to give it a little resistance. Correct. Like I said, my paint was a little thin. See how it dripped down there? But that's a nice full pattern. A lot of contact teeth. So you basically could see where the paint was wore away from the pinion gear interfacing with the ring gear, that's where the two are contacting together and you want it right in the center, right? Correct. We can look at patterns for the next 100 years and not one of them's gonna be the same. So you look at the book and it's like, this is a perfect pattern, well, good luck. So some won't be this full and it can favor the heel. Heel, toe, that's not all that important 
although it is ideal to be centered. Again, there's a lot of contributing factors to that. The housing itself, the gear, mating surfaces, all these things. You're really looking for the shape of the pattern. And this is a nice full pattern. There's not a lot of sharp lines. It's not very clear. We painted that other one. So we'll run that as well, see if we can get a little bit better look. So there's no sharp lines, no sharp faces. This is a really good looking pattern. This is Yukon gear. Deceivingly, there is what seems to be some sharp edges. If you look here and how it comes out, I'm not so concerned with this, concerned with how this round it is. I can show you on your green pinion, your old one. You know, when you're setting pinion prep, it's like you said, convex, concave. So this isn't a flat surface, it's a smooth, curved surface, as is the pinion. So as these things roll together, it's almost like the balls of your feet is what you want touching. And you want the balls to rotate into each other as opposed to like a sharp edge coming into the gear. So if you're way too deep, you're gonna get this sharp edge and it's gonna make the pattern look sharp. At which point, that's when you start to develop heat and the gear will wear itself out. And that's why pinion depth is so important. But the best way to explain it, you've got a cup and you've got a ball and you want those two to roll together nice and smooth. And when that happens, then it creates a different pattern. And like I said, there's a million patterns, two cut, five cut gears, different manufacturers. You really have to get used to them to know what's going on. Obviously we're used to stuff. I feel real good about this one. Some might say that this is deep and we could shallow it up to see, but I can look at the shape of the pattern. So this is definitely centered heel to toe. This is a real nice full pattern, but again, not all that critical. It's this face to flank that you're worried about and the shape of the pattern. No dynamic lines. You can see some rounding here, some rounding here. So you still want any sharp edges. Correct. All right, so heel, toe, face, flank down here in the root. Sometimes they call it the root as opposed to the flank. And then the side that's the drive and the side that's the coast, the so drive side, is here so that's like a convex Con yeah convex. convex this is concave and that's the coast correct again looking at the shape of the pattern is what's the most important and so i only painted the two spots i can paint a third spot and i've also got another tool that we can really run the whole gear through when you're setting up gears and you're looking at paint patterns i guess what i've heard is that seeing the paint pattern and then knowing what the do to get the paint pattern to where you want. That's where a lot of experience comes in. So you see a paint pattern and you know what you want, but how you get there is where the experience comes in, right? Yeah, and it's tricky because there's all sorts of different cuts of gears and different manufacturers. And so patterns vary between them. So nothing almost ever looks the same. So one thing that you can do is you run the stock shim, then you run it deeper then run it more shallow. And now you have experience for how is this pattern moving? And then you can make the right decision based upon the shape of the pattern, which is best, which like I said, you don't want any sharp dynamic edges. You're looking for some round corners. And this particular gear set, this is Yukon. It's got a very, very full pattern. So you don't get those. Sometimes people talk about footballs and there'll be like a small round circle, which kind of very rarely do you get that every now and then. A lot of OEM gear can have a more full pattern like this and they can almost have like a diamond shape to them. So again, it's just getting used to that particular gear manufacturer and how their patterns move. Some patterns are very sensitive to backlash, some are not. These aren't very sensitive to backlash adjustments as far as moving them. If you do have a heel toe scenario, you can try playing with a backlash to center it up. But a lot of times a heel toe is either in the cut of the gear or in the housing itself, and you really can't move it. We set, you know, our pattern. Obviously I had a good starting shim. That pattern is pretty acceptable. We're gonna pull a carrier out and then we're gonna set the actual pinion. And we'll talk about solid space and a crush lead. So same as the first time I pulled it out, 
not quite that tight. We could just run some emery cloth along this surface a little bit just to make it a little bit smoother. It's certainly not bad for it to be that tight. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to get apart. You don't want it sloppy. It still needs to be an interference fit where you have to knock this together, but that's pretty snug. So the other thing is when something's that snug and you really got to beat it out of the housing, you got to be real careful that all that jarring didn't loosen up this pinion bearing and you can check the shim, make sure there's no movement and we can throw it back on the press and just give it one more quick check, make sure it's all the way seated. Especially on a used gear where that bearing surface isn't gonna be as tight. If you had to take that much force to get it out, I almost guarantee you that bearing would start to walk. At which point, if this bearing slides up, that pattern we just ran is not gonna be the same because it's gonna be too deep. It's like we put an extra shim underneath there. So you just wanna make sure that this is all the way seated. So if you notice this crush sleeve, it's got this bow in it. So when I was tightening the pinion before, I was checking it, checking it, checking it. We'd be doing the same exact thing. Uh, and this crush sleeve is hitting bearing to bearing. And so it is setting the distance between these two bearings in these two races. The height of this determines how much load is placed on these two opposing bearings. And you just tighten the pinion nut, and when I say just, it takes 250, 300 foot-pounds to get that thing to crush, and it's a one-time use. So if you ever tighten it anymore, then you're gonna overload your pinion bearings. Being in the off-road world, it's nice to not use a crush sleeve and use a solid spacer because you damage your drive shaft or run this into a rock and you bend this pinion flange, you have a pinion seal that's leaking. If we use a solid spacer, then this dimension never changes and we can pull the pinion yoke off, we can put it back on, we can do whatever we want and we don't have to worry about this crush sleeve getting damaged either by a forceful impact or just you having to service something because something got damaged. You don't have to blow the whole diff apart to get a new crush sleeve in it. So we'll use a solid spacer. Pretty much everything we build, we use a solid spacer in. It is a little bit more time consuming because you've got this solid bit of steel and then you have shim. And so these shims are adjustable to adjust the height. So to get the proper preload with a solid spacer for your pinion bearings, you have to change out shims to get it proper, correct? Yes, okay, so it's easier for them to be on top to show. Imagine this is, we'll call it one inch. This is one inch thick and I put the bearing back on it. You know, it's one inch thick, so it's way up here. Well, that race in the housing is way down here. So we have to take shim away. If the bearings are too loose, the pinion is flopping around or there's no preload, then we have to remove shims from this stack so the bearings can come closer together. If we put it in there, we tighten it up and these bearings are over preloaded and or locked up, then we have to add shim. We have to separate those bearings because the races are fixed in the housing and these two bearings are coming together, opposing each other, and we're sucking it together with the pinion. And so we are perfectly shimming it so that it maintains the exact same preload all the time. If it's too loose, no preload, you take shim away. If it's too tight, you add shim. So the benefit of the crush sleeve is to where it's just self-adjusting. You hammer down the pinion nut until you get the right preload and it's set. But with this setup, it's a little trial and error. If it's too loose or too tight, you have to take away shims or add shims until you get it right. So you're gonna have to pull off that bearing maybe a few times to get it right, correct? Well, you've gotta knock the pinion in and out to check it. Yeah. Gotcha, you gotta knock the pinion. Out. Yeah, so that's where the time consuming part comes. Like if you have no idea what this shim is supposed to be, which I think this is like a 50, 53 thou. So 52 thou, that's a pretty good dimension. These set up at like 50 to 53 typically. There's multiple shims here. So it's good to take an overall height, but like thousands matters, like one thousandths matters. So what I like to do is if I'm changing, I like to check them individually to say, okay, this is a 12 thou. I need to change it two thou. Now I'm going to find a 10 instead of trying to stack them all together, because I think there's a little bit more variance on like how hard you squeeze them together. You know, here, 51. I could probably get it to 50 if I squeeze hard enough. Again, measuring, especially a stack like this, is almost user preference. So if you use this dial here, it'll bottom out. So that says 53. 
but I bet you if you measured these individually, you'd come up with 52. And a thousandth matters in setting these. So again, these are not all that complicated, but more time consuming if you don't hit it right the first time. If you do the crush sleeve right the first time, it is what it is. You just put it in there, you tighten it until the preload's correct and you're done. So Chase did the same thing. He slid the pinion underneath, he tapped it on with the hammer, got the pinion out on, hit it with an impact wrench, got all the slack out. And he could tell just by feeling it that the tolerance is too tight. So he has to take it back apart and he's gonna have to increase the size of the shims to loosen it up a little bit because there's too much preload on those pinion bearings right now. Yeah, we can put our gauge on it, but she's too tight. That's probably 50 inch pounds, way too much. All right, so we've got our solid spacer on there. Bearings are lubricated. Put your outer on. You got enough pinion thread sticking out. So those shims go underneath the bottom of the solid spacer, right? Not on top. Ours do. So we actually make our own shims. The ones that you get from like Trail Gear makes them, I think Marlin makes them, Yukon, etc. The shims go on the top side. I don't like those. They're too thin, they're too small. So we actually made our own shims to go on the bottom. So in between the solid spacer and the bearing, right? Correct, yeah. You can go top or bottom, it doesn't matter. But when you watch this video and my shims are on bottom and yours are on top, you might wonder why, and that's why. Gotcha. That's because those are our shims. All right, so I think that's still a little snug. It's close, so it's probably 18. No, that's about 30. Too tight. So that was at 30? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we gotta add shim. So Chase is gonna have to add some shim height to spread the bearings further apart because the preload is too high. So right now Chase is measuring some shims with his micrometer and he's gonna increase it by what? Like a couple thousands? Yeah, two. Uh, one thing to pay attention to is you just don't lose any along the way. Particularly if you're shimming on the top of the solid spacer, what happens a lot of times is they'll get stuck here. But anyways, they could fall out. You end up not doing the same thing that you thought you were. You know, you thought you added, but really you lost 10,000, you know, on the floor because it was stuck somewhere you didn't realize. We'll try this. Hopefully this is the one we can put a pinion seal in it. All right, that's about 18, so still a little too much. I'll adjust it again, but for the sake of the video, we can move on. I'll show you about putting the pinion seal in. Okay. What was the end result again that we wanted with this? 8 to 12 is where I like to live on these. If this is like an off-road truck, you're trying to build it for strength, 15 is fine. If you're like an overlander with big tires, a lot of weight, running down the highway, trailers, etc., etc., you cannot load these pinion bearings. So 8 to 12, book spec, I can't even remember. I think it book spec might be like 15 to 22. I've got a book right here. Oh, they have backed it down, 12 to 15. So for this part of the process, you're gonna wanna keep on changing out the shims till you get a preload of eight to 12 inch pounds with a beam style or needle style torque wrench. All right, so the way I like to put pinion seals in is pulling the yoke off. This yoke's a little bit tight. You can hammer the yoke off this way. This pinion bearing is so tight that the pinion's really not gonna move. So I can just jiggle it to pop the flange off but now my pinion's still in there. So now we can put in our pinion seal without fighting the pinion, the yoke, and the outer pinion bearing all at the same time. So I always put my pinion, get it in place, pull the yoke off, then go back, put the pinion seal in. So then all we're doing is slide the flange on. And I also like to clean these thread surfaces. We'll put Loctite on those. So again, a lot of different ways to put in pinion seal. Some people put RTV. We only use Toyota seals. Toyota doesn't really use anything on the outside. If this surface is damaged, I'll use an RTV or I really prefer to use an anaerobic sealer if this is what I'm using. But even a light coat of oil with a surface that's in this good of shape, this thing is fine. Now, if we had drug a tool across here, we'd want to put RTV on it to try to fill that gap. Just putting a very light coat of oil to make it slide in. 
you've got this dust shield lip here and Toyota seals are actually recessed. They do not sit flush, they sit down. So before you pop your pinion seal out, you should measure that recess or at least pay attention. You can go deeper, but you don't want it flush because what can happen is depending on what yoke you have on there and tin dust shield, which I think tin dust shields are a waste of time, but this can drag and cause some interference issue if that seal's not deep enough. Yeah, uh, cause I've heard most people say, just drive it in flush with the housing, but you're saying go correct. in a little bit. Deeper. Correct, yeah, they are recessed. So uh, I don't remember what it is, it's like 110 thou. You know, our tool has it set for us, so I don't ever pay attention anymore. Before you put it in, you wanna grease the inside just cause it's easier. And we also pack grease in here to put pressure on this spring because sometimes when you're knocking a pinion seal in or any kind of seal, if you don't pack the backside full of grease and particularly when you are beating a seal in, if you're pressing a seal in, it's not a problem. But when you're causing that vibration of knocking a seal in, it can pop this spring off and then your spring's gonna be down in there and your pinion seal is always gonna leak. So I always like to pack grease around here. You're the first person I've heard say to pack that area behind the seal. Like I've always heard to lubricate the seal, but Correct. packing it, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, again, they don't do that from the OE because typically this disc gonna be built on a line where a machine's gonna come down, it's gonna press it. And so you don't get that vibration. You know, when you give it that good whack, that force can force that spring off. Solid sound, but you can see the recess on it. It's actually a pretty decent recess. When we took the diff apart, it wasn't recessed that much because uh, somebody else had been into the diff before. You're saying when they come from Toyota, they're recessed that much? Uh, that is correct, yep. Gotcha. And the front even more so, which is a big pitfall. And so again, the depth doesn't have to be perfect. You do want it square though, which is the nice part about having it sit flush. It will be square if it's flush, but if you're gonna go recess, it's nice to make sure it's square. The other thing you can do is obviously if you don't have a tool like us, this is the outer pinion race. So you can use it to work yourself around and then you can just measure and try to get close on your square. So there's not a nice actual stop that you can drive it into. You, there, you, could, you could drive it in even further than this. There is a very slight edge in the housing that would technically stop you, but if you hit it hard enough, it's oh, gonna go right past it's it. Gonna go past Which again, if you're sitting flush on this rear diff, it's not a problem so long as this isn't interfering. Well, obviously we're putting an aftermarket yoke on this. It's triple drill, this 29 spline, and we can knock this tin dust shield off if we want to, which is what I prefer to do. And you can see it's recessed in here. It should clear this, but if you don't have this on here, then this can be flush. It doesn't matter. It's not gonna drag on anything or cause any problem. But what can happen is, is people can think that it has preload because the seal is touching the flange, but you don't have preload, it's just the seal is bottomed out on the flange, not the bearings are sucked up. Again, we're gonna run Loctite on the nuts. I'm gonna pull this back apart anyways, cause I'm gonna loosen the preload from that 18 that it was at. The last time we put this in, I didn't have this locking collar in there because I didn't really want to fight it with the side adjuster and the fork. On final assembly, you have to line up the side adjuster and the fork all at the same time. So it's a little bit trickier. So same process as last time, you know, I'm making sure that this thing spins and it should be good. We've got them both threaded in. That one pushed down, no air gap. This one doesn't want to play. There it goes. So no air gap, spins free. And these can spin by hand, so I know they're not cross-threaded. I'm pretty far out on this side this time, so I'm gonna have to adjust this pretty far inboard to get to that zero backlash scenario 
to where we can start setting back like again. Sometimes the races can get a little almost like cockeyed in there. So if you just tap on them, it'll kind of square them up a little bit, even some pressures. I'm going to back this one out just a little bit. So basically you're bringing the ring gear closer to the pinion gear, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So again, this big adjuster is a little tricky to get a lot of load on. Um, so I'm going to turn it one more because we got to also pay attention to where this is and we got to be able to get that in the hole and now we want to finish loading it what do you got now just shy of under eight which i'm fine with eight uh, we got to go just a touch farther to load this up i have another tool over in our gift building department that would allow you to put a socket on it and actually torque it which i talked to tim about a little bit like i can feel that this carrier is loaded i would guess that i've got about 70 foot pounds on it and i can run next door and grab it so we can check it i'll grab a tool that we use to spin this pattern in too so we'll be right back So what you're doing when checking the backlash is just rocking the ring gear back and forth and seeing how much play you have between the ring gear and the pinion gear. All right, so we got our backlash generally set where we want it. It's around eight, seven and a half ish. What is a good range for backlash? Six to 10. Six to 10 thousandths, right? Yeah. I mean, again, it kind of depends on what manual you're reading. If you read the Toyota manual, they get down into four thou. They spec four to six. So it depends on the gear and what you're using. Most aftermarket gear spec six to 10. We like to generally stay in about an 8,000 range, six to eight. If you go any lower than six, that's when we really start paying attention to how much clearance we have between two and checking every two. All right, so I've already adjusted it with my pliers. The pliers start to slip off once you start to get tight. I like to set mine in the 75 range and get a good feel for how much force it takes to rotate this disc. And we have to line up with the grooves here. So as you can see, that's 75 right there and it didn't budge. And I was just doing that with pliers. You know, we can go to 100. We just got to get this little bit extra. Although there is some wiggle room with your adjusters where you can make them but I'd like it to be a little bit closer than it is. So you want one of these to be really square where the keeper screws into, right? Yeah, there is some wiggle room with the keepers, but I like them square. Maybe it's a little OCD. Oh, there it is. So with 100, we're perfect. So I like that. I mean, that's good carrier preload. You can see I have to really grab hold of it. So I like that. Somewhere between 75 and 100 foot pounds is good for the bearing adjuster. Yeah. They get a good pre-look for the carrier bearing. Yeah, which I mean, a torque setting is not very accurate judge. It's a baseline, but imagine if you had a bird thread yeah. in here. You could put 125 foot pounds to it and it still doesn't move. That doesn't change this carrier preload. So you could just tell by the feel that you know you've got a good preload. Correct. And total spin, this diff feels good. It's preloaded, it's tight. So I will go ahead and torque these bearing caps now. So 
if this was a non e-locker differential you'd have another bearing adjuster on this side just like this side correct correct you would get a torque wrench on both of those but with this type you're not going to get a torque wrench on this obviously right yeah it would be very difficult i'm sure we could build something that would do it but you're squeezing these two bearings together so torque on this side is the same as torque on that side like it shouldn't change side to side unless something's actually moving but it shouldn't we've reached the point of the bearings are seated in the race as we have preloaded it and now we have actually put a value to it but again it's all here what's the preload of these bearings and it's fine you don't need to torque both sides you need carrier bearing preload which absolutely is established at this point gotcha so now you're gonna torque the bearing caps of spec and what spec is that 75 that's what i always would do it to so 70 is what the book calls for 75 is perfectly within reason So this one, the way it's made, you can't actually get a half inch socket on it. You need a shallow one. I can't remember, Chase, did you put Loctite on these bolts? I uh, know, so you don't Loctite cap bolt. You can, it's not gonna hurt anything, but no manufacturer does. There is some race application discs that we build that we Loctite everything, and I have done that, but no, most people do not. So I like to just double check every bolt, torque it twice, just to ensure. Because honestly, the biggest reason for disc failures is people forgetting to torque one bolt, and not using Loctite. So one bolt backs out and everything's destroyed. So I'm just very anal about going back through and making sure everything's torqued. So final assembly, which again, we left the pinion a little tight. We'll pull it back apart, but I wanted to push the video along. I'm gonna paint my third spot so I've got a really good idea of where this gear rides at every location. This was my thin paint, so it gets some thicker. All right, so the last time I showed you the wrench trick where you put it on the back of the nut and roll it through and you load the pinion, and I told you we usually use the ring gear locking tab that Toyota uses, but we didn't in this case because I want to show you that trick. But when we do use those, the way we spin the dip is we've got a axle shaft tool that will spin in, and now I can rotate. And that's a tool you made, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the thing i like about this is i can really get a good sense of um, how this diff is running with my hands right this is like it's running down the road i can feel it you know i don't feel any tight spots nothing that's not smooth and we can get into a lot of the shadows where it's painted in the shadows meaning the teeth i didn't paint it will leave witness marks so there's your drive right there It seems to be a little bit closer to the heel now, right? Uh, it might have moved just a little bit. Again, that pattern changed just a touch because of the way that we've also ran it through. And this is kind of more accurate to the vehicle and the pattern. That looks fairly centered, huh? Yep. So this is our hand dyno. <laughs> hand dyno? <laughs> I like the name. But obviously if this was like way over here, then you maybe do something or no, because that would be fine too. I mean, again, heel toe on this, I got no issues with. If you had sharp edges on the uh, face flank, then you would go shallower, deeper, right? So if you have a sharp edge in the flank, in the root, that's too deep, you want to pull some away. And that's again, comes with you playing with it, the gear and what it does, like a lot of OE gears, like a Dana gear is very susceptible to uh, backlash. So you changing backlash can also almost change pinion depth is what it looks like in the pattern. These Toyota gears in these Toyota discs, backlash very, very slightly changes your pattern, unless you're way off. I mean, if you got like 16,000 backlash, or yes, it's gonna mess with your pattern. But if you're in that six to 10 range, the pattern is gonna stay pretty consistent. I'm still a little lost, but I'm learning. It's more like top to bottom rather than side to side. It doesn't matter as much. Yeah, face flank. Up here and down in the root. That's the art of it. 
like I'm not gonna teach the art of it. You gotta learn your own art. You wanna yeah. do this, go be an artist, change opinion shims and start reading patterns and looking at them, look at the book, see how the gear moves. If you wanna be good at this and you think that you're gonna build this, set a pattern and do it correctly. I'm not gonna babysit it. I'm not gonna tell you all about it. However, if people buy parts from us, we get pattern pictures all day long. Send me an email with a pattern picture with your pinion depth, with your backlash and a picture of the drive and coast and i'll tell you exactly what to do because you know we have shops that buy from us all the time all sorts of people are like my pattern was perfect i'm like really i built like 50 yesterday i wouldn't say any of them were perfect i would say they were right but they weren't perfect so again if you don't have a lot of experience reading patterns then who's to say it's right unless you've gone both ways you've gone too deep you've gone too shallow you've gotten comfortable with the gear and where it wants to be and you know what adjustments do what. I just know because I've seen a million of these patterns, you're not gonna get it any better than that. So if this was my first time and I would go shallower and then I'd be like, uh oh, that's too shallow. And then I would go deeper, uh oh, that's too deep. So then you find this happy medium. But that's not learn, that's earn. You earn it through running pattern after pattern after pattern, which is all we do. So now when we go to build a diff, we can put the pendant shim on there. I would say seven out of 10 times it's correct, or we're making a very small adjustment from there just to dial it in. But that's earned. <laughs> you gotta know the gear, you gotta know the diff, and you have to record it. I mean, a lot of these guys have it memorized. You know, we go back to 2008, and I can tell you what a Yukon gear was setting up at. I can tell you what a Nitro was setting up at, what batch number. You know, if you look at the ring of pinions closely, they'll be stamped with the actual batch number of the gear. Oh, there's a number right there. So yeah, there you go. So this is 804. So that's the last number. So this is the 804th gear they made, right? That was a really big batch. So we know when we switch batches because we track that. Some manufacturers were easier to track than others, but obviously so our inventory, we stock tons of gears because once we find a gear that we like, we want to keep using it, right? We know this gear is good. We know what Tim it sets up at. Let's just rock and roll and let's build this. Versus, especially with the smaller manufacturers, they're doing these small piece runs, right? It's 100 here, 100 here, 100 here. I'm actually switching gear set once a month, right? Because we're just burning through gears and it's a different bat, different bat. I want to find a good bat and stick with it. So once we find something that we really like, we'll buy 100 of them, we'll buy 300 of them, and we'll put them on the shelf because we know what we got. That's basically saving you a bunch of time because the guys already know what shims to use and they're so familiar with them that the setup is just gonna go down much quicker, right? Correct. We also do metallurgy tests. So like, if we're gonna buy 200 gear sets at once or 100 gear sets at once, we've already brought them in, we sample them, we like the shim, we like the way they set up, we like the way they pattern, we like that they're not noisy, et cetera, et cetera. We then send them out to a third party. We have the material analyzed and look for stress factors, machining errors, and all of those things. It costs about 400 bucks because we've used the company a bunch of times where they just kind of run it through the ringer. They'll give us a metal report back. I can tell you that I know what the guys that are making gears actually make their gears out of, and I can tell you there's some false advertisements out in the marketplace. You know, we've had them analyzed. And so we use what we feel is the best gear at that given time, and that can change. They can have a bad run. It starts patterning different. The metallurgy wasn't quite right. The machining wasn't quite right. And those type of things, the metallurgy and the actual machining, like how smooth the surface is for noise, and we don't have anything to check that. The manufacturer should be doing that, but we've gone past that. Because I could build 25 dips before I even know there's a problem, right? And so what, I got 25 runs here. That's no yeah. We're very careful about switching and that's why we buy in bulk and make sure we know what we're using. The days of pulling different gears out of the same box, we've ended that game. COVID was obviously a challenge because supply chain was a little trickier, but we kind of came through that pretty well because we stocked some of them here. What ring opinion gears do they make in a month? Yours interestingly is a nitro, this one is a Yukon. And when we were toying with it, that's why we sent them both up. We can look at the pattern on that one too if you wanted, and I can kind of show you the difference between the two. Side adjuster lock tabs, they do have a split lock washer underneath them, so you don't have to lock tight them. You certainly can, it's not a bad idea. I like to run them down just with uh, my impact here, 
and then I like to take a hammer and make sure that they're folded in and they're nice and square. It's not going to be putting any pressure on the bolt head to knock it off. I think Toyota's torque spec on this is probably like 12 to 15. You're using that German spec, good and tight. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't lost one yet and I haven't broke one yet. Nice and snug and you can look up the specs. At this point, diff is built. We did leave the pinion a little too tight, but you know, we can go back and do that later. When I'm done with a diff like this, I always stop and say, okay, what do we do? Did we pin the pinion nut and lock tight it? Nope, we didn't because we didn't finish it. But typically we would lock tight that pinion nut. You would then pin it. We definitely torqued these bearing caps. I checked it twice. These are definitely tight. You checked it. I've checked the backlash in multiple spots. I've ran it through with my hand dyno there. I made sure that everything feels smooth. I don't feel any catches or any get ups. And we can continue to check backlash if we wanted. Like if I was going to be done with this diff, I would 100% just check it one more time. And it is about 10 in a couple spots. So we can tighten the backlash up a little bit and you know, that might change that heel toe, bring it in a little bit, but I mean, all in all, it's a pretty good looking pattern and I wouldn't be too concerned with it. Again, some backlash adjustment depends on what kind of vehicle it's going into. Obviously, if you run a real tight backlash, it's gonna build more heat, aftermarket gear. It really matters what kind of vehicle it is. If I'm building a 1985 Toyota truck diff, I'm building it a little differently than I am 2015 Toyota 4Runner that's going to see a lot of highway miles and that sort of thing. If it's just a woods vehicle, you're going to want to preload everything as much as you can, obviously without it being locked up, because that preload is what can save the ring and pinion from deflection. When you're putting all this torque through the pinion, it's going to want to blow this ring gear away and separate itself. So the tighter we get these uh, bearing preloads, both pinion and carrier, the better, but not too tight to burn them up. Again, in this particular diff, you have to be very careful about over preloading because they can eat bearings. These pinion bearings and this one carrier bearing was designed in 1986 and they're still using it today in the Tacoma 2016 and newer automatic that the smaller diff, not the 875, they're still using almost an identical setup. And I mean, we've increased torque, horsepower, weight infinitely, and people's expectations of differentials and how long they last and what people are doing. You know, people are carrying camper trailers and all sorts of stuff behind these Tacomas. So you kind of need to know what you're building it for. And by and large, unless you're building a trail rig, you need to be careful with your preloads and not over preload them. You know, if you search around the internet, there is a lot of guys that know how to build diffs that are over preloading, I believe. Certainly more so than what OE diffs are being built at, but we build with more preload than the OE, quite a bit more. So pinion, you know, is in. We did not lock tight this, but when we do, we're gonna lock tight it, and then you're gonna pin the nut for any drift here. And there you go. So you'd wanna lock tight this nut on, and then what torque spec do you guys like to do? You guys always use solid sleeves, right? Yeah, uh, 200 to 250. I mean, at a certain point, it does not change. I believe that over 200 foot pounds is not gonna change. You can put 250 on it, you can put 300 on it. You have a solid steel surface that's not going to change. If it is, then you're literally crushing that solid spacer and it's then acting as a crush sleeve almost. But in order for this pinion not, not to back off, you need to be plus 175. 175 with red Loctite and it peened, that nut is never coming off. I've never lost a Toyota nut, ever. Some of the American vehicles that don't use this peen style and a couple other scenarios, they'll lose pinion nuts all the time. Dodge 1500, nine and a quarter, pinion nuts coming off all the time. All right, so Tim sent his motor in and his sensor, which this is the position sensor. 
it goes in the top of the diff right here. It just screws in. Don't forget about this little washer. Sometimes we get cores back where mail diffs to people and they've left the washer it's stuck right here. So just make sure that um, when you take yours to transfer this over, you keep that washer in. But what that's doing is, is um, when this fork collar slides over, it's pushing this sensor up and in, and that's what's telling you the vehicle's locked in. So it's just a little push sensor to complete the circuit. That's what's telling you when you're locked. Correct. That's how the vehicle knows that it's locked. Nothing to the motors. We kind of touched on it. The diff is unlocked now. It's locked. Tim said he sent his in locked so we could send it back to him that way. There's just a little O-ring on there and there is um, a little dowel. So I like to wiggle it pretty good so that you don't tear the O-ring when you're going down. But then there's the one bolt that holds it right here. And then the other two bolts are still stuck in your housing from when you removed your third. That's where the studs go through, right? Correct, yep. So your two long studs are coming up here, and then there's the bolt here that also acts as a third secure point. All right, we are all done with this job. I know I learned a lot, and if you watch the whole video, I know you learned a lot. This job is very involved. If you're gonna do it right, you have to take your time and make sure you get everything dialed in. You gotta get the right pinion depth. So when you check the paint pattern of the meshing of the pinion gear with the ring gear, it is correct. You have to make sure that you have the right backlash. You have to make sure that you have the right pinion bearing preload. And you have to make sure that you tightened everything properly using Loctite where you should use Loctite and you're gonna be able to reinstall that differential with total confidence that it was done right and it's gonna last you for many, many, many years. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Tool Man and Sean. I wanna give a special thanks to my buddy Ton to making the trip with me and helping me film this. And I wanna give an even bigger thanks to Chase Perry for taking the time out of his busy schedule to film this video with us and share with us all the knowledge he has for doing this type of work. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chase. You're an awesome guy. You're very generous with your time and we really appreciate you. Peace out, happy wrenching, sick mods, and sick differential rebuilds. Bye-bye.